Hey again, uh, Jacob Klein. Going to do uh, radio basics this time around. Um, basics. Uh, we're going to start with controls and go through common language. A basic call and it's kind of the structure of it. Um, emergency frequency and radio failures. Um, so first thing, I'm going to read a, a little story I found, which I think kind of will get us off on the right foot. Um, this is from a pilot out of Australia, and he says, um, Mom once said, don't ever get in a rut, because a rut is just a shallow grave. And he says it very well could have been. Uh, his rut says, from some uncontrolled airfield over the past four years, or sorry, from the same controlled airfield over the past four years, we get the clearance. After takeoff, 360 degrees, climb to 7,000 feet, contact center on frequency, Today, for us, everything was the same, except climbed to 3,000. With lots of communication, traffic, noise, readbacks, relays, and finally, we finally got on the party line. Right after acknowledgement, we called out, leveling at 4,000. Sinner's reply was, what altitude are you cleared for? We checked our notes, swallowed hard, and replied, ah, uh, 3,000? Can we have four? Sinner replied, cleared to 7,000 feet. By the way, we had an aircraft holding at 4,000 feet over the airport. I had hot flashes for the next hour and still do shudder at the thought of it could be reality of our rut. So the importance of communication is pretty high in aircraft where 99% of the time you're not going to see the people that are flying within your vicinity and within kind of your danger zone. Um, anyhow, um, start out with controls. Um, I drew a kind of a basic picture of a radio, um, not very good, but we'll go with that. There's a primary frequency, it's always going to be on the left hand side, and then a secondary frequency. This, the standby frequency is not active in single channel radios. Sometimes you'll have a dual com. What that'll look like is this next to another one like this that are about half the width of each other. And We'll go over that if we see it in an aircraft. Uh, your primary frequency is the one that you're going to be dialed up on and if you push the hot mic on the cyclic this is what's going to come up. Uh, 12285 is what I have it here. This is our base frequency at Hillsborough. Uh, this little button in the middle is going to be a little white button with an arrow facing each direction. If you push this, these two frequencies are going to swap and 12285 will go into standby, 11930 will go into primary. What also that allows you to do is whichever is in the standby is the one that you can change. Uh, this knob is, there's a larger knob on the outside of a smaller knob. The larger knob will adjust your first three digits, everything to the left of your decimal. And then the smaller knob will adjust to the, the digits to the right of the decimal. If you need to go to um, a three digit on the right side of the decimal, you can pull out the small knob and it will say take you from you know 12285 and you pull the small knob out and turn one click right will take you to 122.875 whereas normally if it were pushed in it would take you to 122.90 uh, the other one is the on and volume switch some of them are over here some of them are on this side just depends on which aircraft you get in radio manufacturer <laughs> the date, uh, it's not really important where it is. All it does is if you turn it all the way counterclockwise it will snap off and that's radio off. If you start to turn it to clockwise it will first snap on and then it'll adjust your volume. So common language next thing up. Uh, phonetic alphabet. Why do we use that? It's an annoying thing to have to learn one more way to speak to say your letters with a name for each one, to say your numbers with a name for each one, to say them with a specific inflection. There's a good reason for that. I, I've thought of some basic reasons or some of the basic letters that we can get confused, especially when you're on a radio that's you know, 20, 30 years old, the communication is not the greatest, you're not a very high power transmitter, so um, the tower and other people around you, what they're actually going to hear isn't what you sound like in your own headset. Um, there's a couple letters like B and D, Bravo and Delta. 
So B and D, if you're just saying that over the radio, it could be either or to toss up to, to the receiver of that. Same thing with M and N, Mike and November. Definite difference there, Mike, November. Um, o versus zero, that's another one. Um, that's why we use Oscar versus zero. Oscar doesn't sound anything like zero, so you'll never confuse the two. Uh, calling out altitudes. Um, I've been in trouble for this one several times when I first started. Uh, 1500 to me was 1500. That's not right when you're in an aircraft. 1500, you don't say anything past 9 um, is the way I've kind of started to understand it. Um, 0 through 9 are the numerals that you say. You don't say 10 or above. It goes to 10. Zero. So 1500 zero, zero is 1000. 500 feet and that general rule will keep you safe say 0 through 9 anything above that go back to your 1 um, a basic call so a basic call structure and it varies a little bit with the type of call you're making uh, the example that I'm going to use in my head is uh, we just picked up at Hillsboro and we're at the hovercomb so the first thing you want to start with is the station that you're calling. You want to get the person's attention who needs to be listening to your radio call. So if we're sitting at the cone at Hillsboro, you say Hillsboro Tower. That's their call sign. Uh, next thing, you want your own call sign out there. You want them to know who's calling them. Hillsboro Tower, this is November 351 Juliet Delta. I'm sorry, this is helicopter November 351 Juliet Delta. Uh, the next thing, your location. You want to tell them your location and also your altitude if you're anywhere else but on the ground. But that comes into our location. So Hillsborough Tower, Helicopter 351, Juliet Delta, at the hover cone at HAI. And from the hover cone, there's an additional little thing. I don't have it written up here, but you want your weather. Uh, whenever you call a control tower, you want them to know that you know what the weather conditions are. So. Hillsborough Tower, Helicopter 351 Juliet Delta, at the Hover Cone with information India, requesting westbound departure. And they, you just stand by and they will come back to you with your clearance. So that's station you're calling, your call sign, your location and altitude, and your traffic. So whatever you have to say is the last thing you always say. Um, down to emergency frequency. Uh, in a helicopter, this is kind of a, a spot of toss-up, whether you should actually try and dial this up if you're in an emergency. I don't think you're going to have enough hands. You'll be pretty busy trying to take care of getting safely to the ground at a controlled descent rate. But the emergency frequency is 121.5. 121.5. 121.5. I said it three times, I bet you won't forget it. So, your emergency frequency is there, and this is, dang it, I forgot to fact check this, but I believe it's monitored by military personnel. This is an emergency frequency, and uh, you will hear, I have heard a story of a commercial pilot who said he's been out in the sticks, and because he wasn't in an area that had a common traffic advisory frequency, he would just dial it to 121.5. That way, if anything happened, all he had to do was thumb it up, or key it up and he was already on with the emergency frequency. And as he's flying, doing his work, there's these two guys that get on and just start, you know, jaw jacking on 121.5. Next thing you know, somebody with a little bit of tense, you know, tense tone in their voice gets on. This is emergency frequency. You shouldn't be doing that, la la la. Well, they really shouldn't. Um, that could potentially save or take somebody's life if you're keyed up over somebody and they have one chance to make an emergency radio call before they go down somewhere to give out maybe their location or some vital information that could get them rescue in time to possibly save their life or somebody else's you don't want to be messing around on that frequency um, next up radio failures so I'm only going to go over the basics of radio failures because we're talking about basic radio operation. Um, emergency procedures is, I think, a whole other realm. But 
these there's there's two points here that I just want to mention briefly as we're talking about basic radio communications and radio failures. Uh, it's important to know that if you should have a radio failure, it's possible that people can hear you, you just can't hear them. So continue making your regular traffic calls. Do what you would normally do. Take your time. Make sure you're scanning. But continue broadcasting what your intentions are. And that way, if your radio still is transmitting, you're just not receiving, the people that are out there are going to watch out for you. That being said, the other thing that you want to do if you have a radio failure, of course, and we'll learn about these squawk codes, is squawk 7600. Uh, there's three like emergency situation squawk codes, and 7600 will tell anybody who gets you on their radar that you have a radio failure. But what this is going to do is allow them, if they have a chance, to call the people that are up in your area and make sure that they stay away from you so that you can get the aircraft on the ground safely and get your radio checked out. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. So we covered controls, common language, basic call, your emergency frequency, and we basically touched on radio failures, but nothing in too, too much of a depth. With that, um, the couple things that I wanted to ask is, and I know we just barely covered it, but um, what squawk code do you squawk for lost comms? Good, that's just one of the three, but we'll learn the other ones soon enough. Um, that's just about it. Thanks for your time. And we'll see you next time.